Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and we have a remarkable uh, panel, of course, every Friday afternoon. We have a special uh, cameo guest coming on today. Teresa Pantanella, are you there? I am. Now, what we a also lovely have John- comment, Bill. Thank you. Hello, we everyone. Have- Wonderful. We have John Moore, of course, our preparedness expert. He's also a forensic investigator. He has hosts his own show over at Republic Radio, 7 to 9 a.m., Central Standard Time, Monday to Friday, an amazing uh, consultant if you ever need to get preparedness help. We have Ann Morrison, our scientist. Uh, her website, of course, is homeland-defenseforyou.com. They're dealing with earthquakes, volcanoes, earth changes, radiation. She's a radiation consultant. And, of course, at the bottom of the hour, we'll have Robert Felix, our expert on uh, ice ages, uh, the earth changes such as have been occurring on regular cycles. His two books are uh, Not by Fire But by Ice and Evolutionary Leaps and Magnetic Reversals. And, um, Teresa, you did a recent book that you actually had last uh, December in Las Vegas. I want you to tell us the title of the book and what you consider now since you published this last year and you've had a huge response across the country uh, of your book. What do you think now, considering the new revelations? And we did a 45-minute video on our live stream channel for all those people that want to get our live stream membership. Two video clips, actually, uh, almost over an hour and, uh, plus with Chris Harris reviewing some of the major documents and PDFs from not only the San Onofre and the power blackout here in Southern California, but a major review uh, by the NRC of the Fukushima disaster. And it's a lot worse than even I thought. Well, there's a scary thought, Bill. The yeah. name of my book is America's Chernobyl, Millions Will Die. I Tell titled it that because from Chernobyl... 1.5 million people passed away, depending on how you count them, either directly or indirectly. And Chernobyl was only a month old, was one nuclear reactor. Fukushima was six reactors, was 40 years old, and has 1,565 fuel rods in one, in one fuel pond alone. Right, affect, so the, uh, the entire the, world. The amount of fuel that I think that they estimate is somewhere around 36 times more fuel on the site than Chernobyl. Chernobyl also blew the fuel rods and material apart, so they decreased criticality. So there was one massive blast because of mismanagement of the plant. What's going on in Fukushima is unique. It's not ever been seen before on Three Mile Island or even the Rockadine facility up in California, Northern California. What's happening in Fukushima is the first real cataclysmic corium related transient uh, criticality event because you see neutron beams are coming off this shooting out 20, 30 miles out into space. You can see a blue light in the evening or, or in sundown because it's causing nitrogen to generate blue lights. It's generating hydrothermal and hydrovolcanic explosions because it's creating tritium and superheated steam. It is literally increasing a cauldron of slow neutrons. It's going to increase the risk of an actual nuclear explosion and will probably be more than one or more over a period of many years or even centuries of not only hydrothermal explosions but actual critical nuclear explosions that will vent off massive amounts of radiation from the site that will circulate the planet and make most of northern Japan not only uninhabitable but will salt the entire world with radiation. Yes, it, it will salt the entire Earth with radiation. Thank you for that in-depth explanation, Bill. And when I wrote the book... I knew that the radiation plumes would come towards America, and I was concerned for my fellow Americans. And what I've learned since then, of course, is most people think the problem's over in Japan and not here. There's been a slow awakening to that. Have, Tracy, did you see the article by, uh, uh, I think uh, her name is Consolo. She wrote, uh, she has a thing called Nuke Radio. And um, <clears throat> She tries to follow this and report in her latest article talks about how Fukushima is literally falling apart. The latest, as we talked about this yesterday, Ambassador Morata from Japan has asked the United Nations to intervene now. This is a little late. This is over a year now. And we're seeing a oh, yeah, disaster where the, the if cooling pool number four falls, and again, remember, cooling pool three had the MOX reactor uh, pellets, which right. contain a lot of plutonium. Uh, they know that this is going to go critical and will cause a hydrothermal and nuclear explosion, which I'm going to estimate is going to be in the range of two kilotons. A two yes, kiloton I explosion is equal to, to 800 atomic bombs. 
Right. No, I'm talking about it'll be dirty, so it won't be a full big... If it was a full nuclear explosion, just the cooling pool number four, it's estimated that if you take 10 to 12 uh, pounds of radioactive isotope material to make a nuclear weapon, you would, you would just from cooling pool four make 93,000 nuclear bombs. Oh 93,000. Now... I want to hear now from our expert, John Moore. John, when you hear these kind of numbers and you hear them scrambling around, moving troops, bringing Russian troops to America, seeing lots of other things going on, and the EPA are doing nothing, what do you think? Can't hear you very well, John. We'll try to reconnect with John. What do you think, Anne, when you hear these kind of things and you know the you're the radiation expert, what do you think is happening? And how likely is it that we are going to have a civil disaster in Japan? They're now talking openly about 40 million people evacuated from from Tokyo and northern Japan. They're now openly talking about the fact that that 4% of babies now in northern Japan have actually had brain damage since um, May, March 11th last year. That 28% of all pregnancies are spontaneously miscarrying in the uh, prefectures in, around Tokyo and northern Japan. Uh, they're talking about food that is hundreds of miles away, is heavily uh, level, laden with cesium-137, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, strontium-90, and radioiodine-131, and that it's, uh, they've detected plutonium in Eastern Europe after the March of the January 1 superquake that hit uh, northern Japan and caused a massive release of radiation in the midst of winter that actually was not detected in the West because our sciences are so corrupt. The EPA across Canada and across Western Europe, it was only the Eastern Europeans that reported it. That is bad. Well, yes, and yeah. so in your comments. Well, um, I think that uh, I want to I mention that the union workers are voting on a possible strike at the Pilgrim nuclear power plant. And, uh, you know, that's something else that we're going to have to uh, consider. You know, we're having these Occupy Wall Street and the um, Tea Party and uh, May Day and uh, the unions. And, you know, if the, if the workers strike at the nuclear plants, you, we know that San Onofre is down, and it may be down for the summer. It may be well, down okay. completely. No, I think down permanently. We talked about this extensively yesterday. Uh, one of the things that I do is... I research things thoroughly and then I pray on something. And what I got in both my, when my intellect and my prayer says the same thing, that there was a defect in the tubes, which I got last year when we had the blackout and the massive release of radiation because I had my Inspector Plus sitting on Michelle, my wife's dresser in our bedroom, and it spiked to four times background radiation for three to five days after San Onofre had this hot shutdown. Now we have the final report, which we went over yesterday on live stream. And we know there was a defect in the tube design. They did what's called like-for-like like switching of these tubes and added many more of these uh, st steam turbine tubes. There's a defect in how it's attached to what's called the uh, the plate below it. And so there was leaking tritium all along and other radioisotopes. But when they had a hot shutdown, the whole reactor burned. Most of these tubes burned out large amounts of them, making it not only a radiation hazard, but also very dangerous. In other words, it wouldn't work properly as a steam turbine. This is it with all these reactors. Mark One reactors have a problem with the engineering design, which we went over yesterday from the NRC. Twenty-five of our 104 reactors in America are Mark One. All the reactors in Japan at the Fukushima Daiichi plant, because they're old, are all Mark One. General Electric. They re-engineered them with a faux release system for hydrogen. This is a toxic waste dump that should have had a corium catcher built, a uh, spider silk tent over each facility and over the entire facility, a literally a moat built around it in the seawall, nothing's been done. This is a hazardous waste dump that's going to, and is poisoning the entire world. People say, well, I can't see it or taste it. I can't see it or taste it, not killing me. No. The jaws of the Fukushima Zilla monster are wide open, biting you and your DNA right now, and you just don't know it. <clears throat> and there are solutions. We have them at Nutrimeds or Radiation protocol is available, but you better take action now because it's going to get a lot worse. Back in a moment. Okay. 
Uh, we're back in. Yeah, Rod is an amazing guy. The president of the A4M. Uh, we are back in with uh, Teresa Pantanella, John Moore, and Morrison. John can only stay for another few minutes, so I want you to kind of bring this story forward, John, of the latest research. And, of course, your show is on 7 to 9 a.m., Monday to Friday, on Republic Radio. Uh, and your website is thelibertyman.com, thelibertyman.com. And, right. Uh, well, tell us about this story. I've now confirmed this story from four independent, private, trusted sources that uh, Russian special forces, they call themselves butts nuts. They started arriving mm-hmm. May 21st, less than two weeks, uh, at Fort Carson, Colorado, 200 of them. Now, if you have to understand what a four-man team is, a uh, series of four-man team special forces uh, taking and using, using their weapons and tactics can actually literally paralyze an entire section of the country. You don't need well, large they don't numbers. Even, all they need is common hardware store items to do what you described. Right. Uh, In other words, axes yeah. and, and, and axes and, and uh, sledgehammers, quite frankly. Right. So uh, w- what we have to understand, and you know this as a military man, I know I worked with special forces in the military, although I wasn't in the military. I worked most of my career with the military. What you have to understand is when you have properly trained people that work together as special, well-trained, like a machine, oiled units, you have something very deadly. Uh, and you don't need huge numbers to literally paralyze the country, cut off communications, cut off transport, uh, right. do all kinds of havoc. And uh, what I did back in 1999 is I gave a, a little, if you want to call article, that I was published in the Prophecy Club newsletter, uh, that basically was a dialogue from a vision that I had that the U.S. president would invite Russian special forces on American soil to be embedded in our military for a, quote, a time such as this, when the government pulls things like the Expatriation Act and National Defense Authorization Act would want to literally have total control, bring on chaos, and then literally have people that he could rely on, special forces that would shoot at American citizens, that would be looking exactly like our military in uniform and would speak English. And that's right. exactly well, what you're Well, your, your revision from 1999 is, uh, is unfortunately coming to pass. They are being invited. We're expecting mm. 30,000 to 100,000 to arrive here before the end of the year, which is only seven months away. Right. And they are, they're coming as permanent party. They're not here for temporary training. Yeah, they're, they're not, not here for weapons and tactics. Military uh, basis. Yeah. Most of the time, people don't realize that anywhere from 400,000 to 1.2 million foreign uh, military personnel and police are being trained on American soil at any one time. But these are permanent, and they are special forces spitznots. These are the top of the top. They're like killing uh, machines, and uh, they're capable of just, you know, if they want to kill your your, uh, distribution network for power or water or literally chop off roads or start doing specific targeted attacks, uh, they're incredibly dangerous. And they, they are, very, absolutely. They're very stealthy, they and they, they are not easy to wipe out because they can do guerrilla tactics, they can do all kinds of things, and they can look just like your regular soldiers, which ordinarily most American citizens oh, would like ordinary Americans. You could be standing behind one in, in Walmart and not know the difference. They speak English with no accent at all. Well, well, what I found out from my contacts over the years is that they're already doing weapons and tactics and other training, embedding them in Colorado for years, down in places like uh, southwestern Colorado, Grand Junction, uh, areas up near Fort Collins, uh, all kinds of operations going on for years, and literally they're being housed in apartments or buildings, and you know these people don't have regular jobs, and they're actually uh, for, uh, foreign uh, troops from uh, former Soviet Union. The other well, thing usually that would be, that's how I would do it. I would bring in my advanced party to get them acclimated so they could get the rest of the guys squared away. Now, the other thing you have to understand is 42% of the Russian military, and this is across the board, more so in the army than elsewhere, are Muslim. And that includes white Muslims. We're talking about white Muslims like from Chechnya uh, and other republics in uh, in the Soviet Union. And I believe the Soviet Union has never gone away. People say, oh, the Soviet Union's gone. That's no, that's a, that's a dream. What, what, my military, <laughs> what my military people say and what I say is that, uh, and my Russian friend who said this to me years ago, he said, we just change hats. In other words, the right. oligar- they just change hats. They're no longer communists. They're now oligarchs and they're businessmen, but they just change hats. That's about mm-hmm. it. it. The whole thing's been an orchestrated ploy is all it's been. Right, exactly, yeah. Amazing. Um, so, John, any other major news happening? Well, um, uh, we need, we, with the way things are going, Dr. Bill, we may need to be talking privately in the, over the next week or so to get up to speed on this. And I, my, I mean, It's just fast-breaking. My contacts just call me two or three times a day. Yeah. 
And we can do also an emergency report if you'd like on our live stream channel. We can do that anytime. Right. Just drop me, drop me a quick I email. Take care of the guests, and I need to move on to another appointment here. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Um, and the radiation issue is dealing with many different areas. We have uh, with Dr. Pantanel's book. I want you to to say the primary points that you mentioned in your book, uh, Teresa, but this radiation issue has been downplayed. Even I remember in the newsletter by Joel Skousen, who's usually 99% of both geopolitical, financial, and other issues, he literally totally dissed the whole idea that, that San Onofre is a problem or that the Fukushima is going to be a problem or produce isn't radioactive. They forget the thing is the solution to pollution is not dilution. That it bioaccumulates, and that one atom, one atom of plutonium embedded in your liver, your kidney, your brain, is a death sentence. You just don't know when it's going to be chiseled on your gravestone. So people need to grasp this. Radioiodine causes birth defects and spontaneous miscarriages. It's going to cause cancer is the last of the diseases you get. When you get radiation exposure, you get dementia, heart disease, uh, fertility, uh, drops in IQ, you get cardiac arrhythmias, hypertension, you get all kinds of other illnesses, diabetes, long, long before cancer is if you survive those, if you survive those. So after Chernobyl, most of the people died of these other illnesses. They didn't live long enough to get cancer, did they, Teresa? No, no, they certainly didn't. They had strange illnesses with their kidneys. They yeah. had respiratory illnesses. Uh, in Tokyo, they were experiencing things like uh, unexplained bleeding dis disorders, people showing up in the hospital with unexplained symptoms, uh, loss of teeth, loss of hair. Well, what they're getting is they're losing, there's four classes of rapidly producing cells in your body. The crypt cells, which are in your small bowel, because your bowel renews your cells every four days. The uh, bone marrow cells in your bowel, cells in your body that are basically, we call the, the primary cells that generate your platelets, which uh, prevent clotting problems. Uh, and all the blood cells, the hematopoietic cells that make red cells, white cells, lymphocytes. And then the next is the neuroglial cells in your brain that rapidly are reproducing, uh, that protect your brain and actually stop it from being damaged. And the, and the fourth uh, group of cells uh, are the cells in uh, your sex organs. For example, males, it's a sperm. It's, it's So these are affected very, very quickly. Germ cell line cells are very, very affected. The problem is people don't realize that these have very quick consequences, and the Japanese were very good to, to document what happened after uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and those who took things like miso soup and uh, nori and other things that were non-radioactive from other parts of Japan and, and took things that were radioprotectants, they survived. It, the key is not whether you're exposed to radiation, it's whether you can make cells to replace the ones that are damaged or going to die. The key is right. not that Fukushima had happened. It's are you going to take radiopharmaceuticals like our first line of defense kit, uh, our radiation protection protocol like Nutritrol, along acting alpha-lipoic acid, MycoD2, cell detox, assess yeah. acetyl glutathione, oh, Nutri Defense, which I designed that will chelate out the heavy metals and isotopes. If you don't take these now, these bioaccumulated isotopes will kill you. And before they kill you, they're going to hurt. They're going to give you cancer, dementia, heart disease, arrhythmias, many other problems, infertility, birth defects, brain IQ damage, peripheral neuropathy. Every illness you can imagine will happen. It won't be comfortable. Attention. And I'm under trouble, you know. Eventually I got fired for it because he... I got fired, yeah. But Dr. Deagle's a heart... Dr. Deagle's a heart ass. And we're back with uh, Teresa Pentanella uh, and Ann Morrison. Of course, we're also joined by Robert Felix. Welcome to the program, Robert. Thank you, Dr. Deagle. I'm glad to be here. Now, we have Teresa is our expert on radiation. She's written a book, and I want you to repeat the title. And, of course, you have a website, too, Teresa, so people can obtain your book. It's called? It's called America's Chernobyl, Millions Will Die. The right. website is triple W, of course, rad, R-A-D, Detox, D E T O X dot com. Yeah. It's R A D D E T O X dot com. And I would encourage everyone to go right to chapter nine, where I wrote about surviving a nuclear attack as well as nuclear power plant meltdowns. Right. Now, and we already had a, a, if you want to call it a station blackout induced 
uh, radiation surge from San Onofre. That's long gone now. It shut down. It's probably never get back up again, thank God. But the radiation level from Fukushima is, on average, and it's not just hitting California. A lot of people get arrogant. Oh, you poor people on the West Coast. Oh, my gosh, it's so bad. No, no, no. Radiation whips right past us, hits the mountains. It may be worse in Croatia than it is here on the West Coast. So people assume that it's just going to drop because of the nearest piece of land it hits. Uh Uh-uh. It could be uh, at 7,000 feet, and it may not happen until it rains down over Missouri or uh, the coast of England. That's right, when it comes down in the rain. And when you're out there in the rain, you want to know where that weather system came from. So the thing is, we don't have, what we should be having is weather balloons up, aircraft up, uh, real-time measurements so you can Google online and see a picture of the Earth. That would be beautiful. We should have reports along coastal reporting centers along the coast, along the Midwest, along the mountain ranges, the highest levels of radiation before the radnet set down and turned off and actually took away their equipment was Boise, Idaho, and areas in Colorado. People think, Colorado, that's not near the coast. How come that was so high? Well, the mountains rake the moisture out. So if you're sitting in Colorado thinking, oh, those poor people in California, no, no, no. You're getting a heck of a lot more radiation there, and where it rains in the Midwest or on the East Coast or even way over in England or, e- or Western Europe, if you get more rainfall, guess what? You're getting more radiation if, and this is a big if, if the radiation plume is concurrent with that. There's been days when it's rained here, and I don't detect anything. And there's other days when it's sunny, and I'm thinking, what the heck is going on? The radiation thing is spiking up to three times background. Uh, so you can't base it on, you can't taste it, you can't smell it, and you can't even predict that necessarily this particular rain cloud is going to be one bringing down radioisotopes. You can't. And nobody's reporting. The EPA aren't reporting. UC Berkeley uh, Nuclear Engineering isn't reporting. We need private contracted to universities that are going to report, and we don't, we fire them. We need to have international committees reporting at multiple nations, and we need them also checking the fish. They're finally saying now the Canadians are going to be te- checking fish, and there's a fish company here in America to say they're going to report strontium and cesium. Really, I think people should walk up to the fish counter with their uh, their um, <laughs> Inspector Plus or Inspector EXP. And by the way, we're putting up a new link so people can get the entire catalog for uh, the uh, less EMF, which gives the radiation detectors. The oh, best great. ones, I think. And uh, I literally, I tell people, if it goes click, 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 then back away from the fish counter. <laughs> Don't walk away. Use some common sense. Back away, back away. But if it's not radioactive, it's cool. And again, remember, if you take a probiotic, uh, literally it's something Dr. Asaf Jurakovic did work on this 25 years ago, that just simply taking something as simple as a our living probiotic or living probiotic ultra chelates out 85% of strontium and cesium. And then this is animal studies he did. So when you add other things like Nutritrala, Nutridine, other things, enzyme protections like Re- Regenerex, Cell Detox, Glutathione, and Nutritrella, these are very unique. Uh, you can find other things like flavonoids and this and that, and they're going to help. And a, we call a radiation detox diet like the Japanese had after Fukushima, like miso soup and nori, etc. But make sure it's they not went, Japanese. Yeah, they went on a uh, macrobiotic diet, brown right. rice, miso soup, right. mari soy soup. It made a big it's deal. easy to make at home. Yeah, easy to do. Now, those are going to be somewhat helpful, but the Newton Red Line are... E- I'm just beyond that, and I'll tell you why I know this. <clears throat> 1973, when I was working on my PhD in marine molecular biology, I was also assisting my colleagues doing work on the cell biology department on an offshore U.S. military project to protect our troops and the Canadian American troops from radiation from a nuclear war so they could boots on the ground within two days of a nuclear war. And they did succeed in developing specific drugs and or nutraceuticals to block radiation damage. If they take my protocol, they'll cut out 98% of the effect of radiation. Wow. 98%. And I, that's what I'm saying. If you're over in Japan, uh, people need to not only have a, a bug out bag, but they should be bugged out already. But if you're in Japan, you better get out because they could have a hydrothermal volcanic explosion or an actual critical dirty bomb nuclear explosion there any day now. And if there's a level 7 earthquake, which is virtually guaranteed within the next six months, you're going to have cooling pool 4 and the whole place become a cauldron of death. 40 million people scrambling for the doors in Japan and a radiation cloud heading toward the whole Western world, which means all of your food outside growing will soon become radioactive. I mean, not just a little radioactive. I'm talking about 
oh my God, if I eat this, will I die radioactive? And people say, that can't happen in 2012. I say, I don't know if it will. But I can tell you, it sure as hell looks like it. It's like you're watching a building on fire and you're wondering if the timbers are going to fall on people's heads and you can hear cracking sounds. Well, if you're a firefighter and if you're an EMT emergency doctor like I've been, yeah, yeah, I can. And it will. In fact, it's just a matter of time. We don't know when it'll happen, but it will. Uh, and your comments on this, because this is important to people understand this is a time when we're having earth changes, super volcanoes, super earthquakes, extreme weather, and power blackouts, which also make these nuclear reactors much, much more dangerous, too. I just wanted to mention that if uh, people want to test their Inspector Plus or uh, the other one, the, you said it came with a probe. Yeah, the so Inspector that, uh, EXP is a little bit more expensive because it has a fancy probe. You can clip in the top of the Inspector, and you can move the probe right over things. It's really cool. When they go into the, when they go into the grocery store, they can go up to the bananas, and the uh, it, the Inspector, it, sh- it should, at that time, uh, start beeping. Yeah, the reason we is we, people don't realize that potassium is a is a is a radioisotope. That's right. It's potassium forty, and it's yeah. naturally occurring. Yeah, um, it's a naturally occurring isotope. So yeah, don't don't be freaked out by your radioactive bananas. Uh, it gives it's a very very weak uh, beta emitter. It's not going to kill you. And it's like I say, a little bit of radiation actually is not going to is not going to fry you. But certain radioisotope molecules. Now, I want to propose something else. Doctor Nikola Tesla actually proposed to. Uh, the the original team that discovered radioisotopes, Madame Curie, who was dying of radiation sickness back in the 1920s, and he told her he could make what's called a time-dependent scalar frequency that would shatter the molecules based on their periodic table of elements. And I have an idea how to do it <clears throat> to create what's called a what's called an ion molecular uh, atomic cyclotron resonance device. And what you would do is you'd actually create an ion field that would literally shatter the non-radioactive part of the molecule away from the radioactive, so it would speed up the rate of decay. So a molecule like cesium that has a half-life of, you know, what is it, uh, 42 years or something like that, ridiculous, or 50 years, it would uh, speed that half-life to be maybe six months or three months or two weeks. And you've got to do that because these isotopes are constantly coming out, but they're also salting the entire planet. We are literally seeing the embedding of radiation that's going to spoil the food supply and mutate animals and plants and organisms and likely produce super pathogens forever. We're not just talking about for a little while. This is a forever thing. This is, oh, my God, this is not a 2012 thing. This is like, a, you know, this the entire... This is the rest of your life and this everybody rest, you know and this generations is the, to come. Yeah, this is for forever, forever. So, in other words, we need to think out of the box and think of great geniuses like Tesla to say, look, oh yeah, we can create a scalar frequency that would shatter it. Now, let's let's get into this issue of well, Earth changes. Uh, Robert, you, we're seeing some major changes in weather and extreme storms, snow, everything. And when we come back, we're going to hear all the latest on what's going on with the Earth changes that are going to make... A lot of the plans, is, as jo- Robbie Burns used to say, the best laid plans of mice and men gain after glay, and in uh, Gaelic that means often go as... The- Welcome back. Uh, quick announcement. You want to make a warning, uh, Trace, about food, buying fish or going out and eating publicly. Uh, and then we're going to hear from uh, Robert about the latest on what's happening with volcanoes, etc., which are triggering off and moving us toward an ice age. Yes, I just want to tell the listeners to be careful, especially when they're at a buffet where they can't control who ordered the food, where the food came from. There's a sales, if you will, wholesale of Asian fish. I was recently, yes. By the way, don't assume if your relatives are in South Korea or China that they're safe because the radiation level within a week was detected over China, over 22 provinces, and the waters carry radioactive water toward the Chinese waters of the South China Sea. So the entire area, including the Philippines, if you're buying, let's say, seaweed, which is real popular in America or other Western countries, uh, a lot of the seaweed is getting progressively more radioactive. And they did testing off, UC Irvine did testing in Orange County of seaweed, and they found the seaweed off California is becoming significantly more radioactive. <sighs> so, yeah, so people yeah. need to understand that, that... In the South China Sea, the Philippines, even the Nori in uh, the South Island of Japan, the radiation levels are double of radioiodine-131 and strontium-90 
uh, or than they were in CC137 than they were last year, uh, March, March 11th, 2011. So what's going to happen is <coughs> the black current will carry that radiation around the Earth in two and a half years, and every ocean on Earth will be laced with plutonium and radioisotopes, every single ocean. Two and a half years. So in another year and a half, which means 2013, there is not an ocean on Earth that will not have some residual radioactivity from Fukushima. I saw something really scary on the news bite, was that uh, they were looking at the trash that was coming, the radioactive trash that was coming into British Columbia off the, uh, from Japan, you know, that big uh, pile of wood and everything else. Yeah. And they, had, they, had a, they did have a radiation meter, but they had no protective clothing at all. Right, right. And, and so I don't know what they were thinking, because if the meter starts clicking, I mean, what are they going to do, pick the where, thing up? Where were they moving the trash, by the way? Excuse me? Where were they moving that trash? Well, they, they weren't moving it. They were, they were trying to decide what they were going to do with it. I mean, it's yeah. such a huge well, they're moving amount it all over. They're moving it all over Japan. I use the joke of a guy called Fukushima Way. It's a new product. You know, the tagline is, wipes away rumors. Rumors that your part of Japan is non-radioactive, so they want to be good Japanese citizens by shipping the radioactive waste and not only poisoning their own country, so nobody can be arrogant to say, this part of Japan is nice for your little kids to kind of move to. No, no, we're going to make the entire northern hemisphere radioactive by literally burning at high temperature, 2,000 plus degrees, 150 million plus tons of radioactive debris, and re-inject it into the troposphere so you in Europe and Canada and America, you can't get arrogant either. It's Fukushima way, wipes away any rumors that you're less radioactive. How's that? <laughs> that is very that? clever. That is well, very clever. Uh, uh, I have a twisted uh, mind. A twisted mind. Sometimes you can only get through to people when you have a twisted mind, you see. Other people like to just criticize you and say, he just thinks he knows everything. I'm sure you get the same thing, Teresa. She just thinks she knows everything. Well, we don't know everything, but the things we know, if you don't heed them, it's not going to be good. The outcome's not pretty. No, it's not pretty. Not a pretty situation at all. Um, Robert, you have some things to talk about these uh, earthquakes and volcanoes. What's going on? Well, you're talking about this uh, radioactivity, and, and I'll lead into that, mm -hmm. too. But there's a, there are growing fears that there's a huge volcano in North Korea that could soon erupt. Now, there's a geologist at uh, Pusan National University who thinks Mount Baekdu, I hope I'm pronouncing that r correctly, could erupt soon. And this Mount Baekdu is huge. It's the highest mountain on the Korean Peninsula, and it, it last erupted in 1702. There's a, a ge geological expert in Korea says it could erupt in 2014, 2015. If it erupts, it could be 10 to 100 times greater than, than the April 2010 eruptions in Iceland that shut down the, the uh, airspace over Europe. The, it it uh, had one of the l largest known eruptions in the past 10 years, 10,000 well, years. That was I, I, about 1,000 years ago. Important saying that, that I think you've led me to see that the that the truth of the Bible is true, regardless of what people see and, and told, quote, everything kind of comes together. And it says, yes. unless those days were shortened and one-third of the, literally the shortening of one-third of the day and one-third of the night, one third of the day and night, that sounds like something in space, which means a debris cloud around the Earth. So literally a third of the sunlight was cut out during the day, and a third of the starlight by night means we're going to have a massive release of material that will block the sun to cause the Earth to cool rapidly, and will also block the sunlight, too, and the starlight. <clears throat> it means we're going to have a super volcano, and that super volcano, I believe, is actually in some ways going to save us, believe it or not, because I think the global maniacs want to start a thermonuclear war, they're rallying 22 divisions in Israel. They're planning on trying to start a war which makes no sense whatsoever for anybody, including the people in Israel. Uh, there's lots of elements within Israel that want to stop it because the best way to prevent the enemies from attacking is to make sure there's an extra polished sheen on the Israeli nuclear weapons. If we're going to do anything, we need to actually go into Syria and Iran and remove these short-range missiles that are aimed at Israel's throat and I believe that that needs to happen, and that can be done very easily by squeezing them economically and say, look, we're going to bring in missile teams, special forces, we're going to disassemble these things, and if you won't do it, we'll hit with our star-based weapon systems, which we have. 
we need to start literally getting ready for earth changes that are going to be so cataclysmic that any nuclear reactors near them we know that the five nuclear reactors in Switzerland, for example, are sitting on or within a five-mile strike zone of a major earthquake fault line. Did you know that, well, Teresa? All of the all of the reactors in Switzerland. So the Swiss are not stupid. They say, "We're out of here. We're not doing nuclear." <laughs> the only problem, the only problem, is that they say, "Oh, it's going to take us to 2025 or 2032." Swiss, you got the right idea, but you don't have the right gear. In other words, you're not doing what we call the speed of the flash. If you don't get rid of these nuclear reactors and radioisotopes sitting on fault lines when the Earth starts to shake and rattle and roll, if you don't get these nuclear reactors off the San Andreas fault line zone, like the Diablo Canyon up near the literally Indian burial ground, Diablo Canyon, or you don't get rid of the New Madrid fault nuclear reactors and switch them to natural gas, we're screwed. And we're talking about radiation literally from 504 plus reactors. The Chinese, in a, just a couple of years, put 35 reactors in with the Queen and Rio Tinto mines and Carlisle Group, which is owned partially by the Rothschilds and former President George Bush, etc., and all the other global maniacs. They plan to build 500 nuclear reactors in China in the next five years. 500. There's also <clears throat> nuclear reactors that are within range, uh, quite a few of them apparently, within range of this, uh, this Mount Baekdu in Korea. <clears throat> and uh -huh. this, this mountain erupts on average every 1,000 years with a huge eruption. It has smaller eruptions in between time, but a huge eruption about every 1,000 years. And guess what? The last eruption was approximately 1,000 A.D. So it is... It is due, and if that happens, it could be 50 times stronger than when Mount Vesuvius buried and destroyed Pompeii. So okay. we're talking about a huge, huge volcano that is within range of those nuclear reactors that you're talking about. Uh, okay, now, uh, one of my favorite shows, I don't know if you've seen it, uh, Teresa, but I'm sure if you haven't seen it, you need to see it this weekend. Tell me. You're, and you also may have to make sure you don't laugh too hard or you'll get a hernia. It's called Doomsday Preppers. Uh, it's not only people laughing at themselves but preparing, <clears throat> it's also posing real questions. It's not perfect, and in a sense they have tongue-in-cheek, and the National Geographic Channel tries to kind of talk about the outliers or people that are preparing. And, and there's an interesting article by Joel Skousen, who I literally agree with 99% of what he says, but people are making fun of survivalists. Well, the biggest survival issue of the 21st century is going to be all these events. In fact, an ice age will kill more people than even a nuclear war. People don't know that. They don't know well, that an ice age will kill more people than a nuclear war. They don't realize that Fukushima is a nuclear war effect radiation-wise of poisoning the entire northern hemisphere. They don't realize that the decrease in the magnetic field of the Earth with the chance, because we're passing through every 62 million years, we pass through the galactic plane with the Orion arm of the galaxy, and we mm -hmm. are going to have a major magnetic reversal occur. The Radio Magnetic Research Institute in Moscow, the one in Johannesburg, the research facilities in Osaka, Japan, have been researching this, put a satellite up three years ago. They literally watched before the giant super earthquake in Santiago, Chile, where the South Pole magnetically from space-based satellites said, bye-bye, I'm out of here. And you looked down and said, where's the South Pole magnetically? It was gone for a couple of days before the superquake struck. So if we don't think that major things are going to happen, and on top of that we have all these stupid nuclear reactors sitting there like sitting ducks ready to blow up and poison us all, as you say in your book, America is Chernobyl, much worse, yeah, America is Fukushima, and each one of these particles is like a little Fukushima inside every one of your organs. All you need is one little, one little radioactive isotope in your salad, and you've ruined your entire anti-aging yeah. plan. Websites: iceagenow.info and site homeland-defenseforyou.com. Teresa, your website is radbetox.com. Excellent. We'll have you back on next week. 